Good morning. Let's pray together. Our Father, you've called us uh, to a life which is greater than any life we could achieve on our own. You've given us power and strength and holiness in Jesus Christ when we had no means of, of achieving closeness to you and love of you. You've drawn our hearts away from the world and to you. You've done it by your son's death on the cross and by his resurrection and the forgiveness of sins and the sanctification of your people. So, Father, draw our hearts to you today again. Fill us with the Holy Spirit that we might truly worship and praise you and give you glory as we sing to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise together and sing. If you, uh, if you didn't open it up yet, because I sent it out late, I've sent you uh, notes if you want to follow along with the, uh, the lecture. Uh, today's topic is very important. We deal today uh, with the serial, uh, ceremonial law or, or the supernatural law. Uh, the, the divine law, the supernatural law, the, the ceremonial law uh, are very important to Christian faith because we are concerned in the Christian faith not predominantly with the actions of man, but what can be accomplished by God uh, through our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a, a central issue of, of Christianity. The world's religions typically, um, well, the world's religions before uh, Jesus Christ focused on the power of man or the ceremonial action of man. Jesus came and gave us the gospel, which is not a ceremony. It, it is the power of God to life and salvation and righteousness through his, his blood. The coming of Jesus Christ replaced rituals. And we, are, we were told in the Old Testament, uh, because it is a perfect law, that although these are rituals that should be performed, they are looking to realities that are seen in heaven. They are looking to realities and promises which will come. What they are about and their power is not in what you're doing now. It's in the faith in God's promises. It's in the things which are symbolized by these rituals, not in the things themselves. The, the basic uh, issue in holding to Christian faith as churches, as churches we've seen over the centuries, comes that ritual itself is extremely powerful and indeed, in some ways, extremely good. Of course, if you, if you have read any uh, Confucian philosophy or Neo-Confucian philosophy, you know the central importance of ritual in Confucianism, which is based on the quite correct observation that rituals have a good effect on people. They draw them together in unity. They elevate minds. Uh, they're a good tool of shaping and directing minds. A ritual and civilization are, are largely intertwined. And a great deal of the goodness and humanity that we would show to other people requires us to coordinate through, through ritual. Uh, because of this, a, a long-standing temptation of Christians, and Junius would have in mind here particularly the, the church of his day that he had escaped from its persecutions in, in France and was being chased around Europe by it, uh, the Roman Catholic Church quite correctly observes that rituals have a very strong power. Like Confucianism, it attributed a very, very strong power to, to rituals, and Ironically, if you're familiar with, with the, the way the, the gospel sounds, created a whole law of rituals called the canon law and uh, said that people's salvation was dependent upon participating in these rituals. The whole work of the Reformation in some sense, the great emphasis of the work of the Reformation in some sense was to say, yes, of course, there are human goods in rituals, Yes, of course, uh, Christ ordained rituals of a particular kind, which didn't uh, draw away from his work, but rather reminded us of his work. They were different kinds of rituals because they pointed us to the work of Jesus Christ rather than pointing to the power of the rituals themselves. Uh, but the reformers believed that the Roman Catholic Church had lost sight of this essential aspect 
of God's plan in history, which was to prepare man through rituals to understand God's power and God's love, and had corrupted the church by reinstituting rituals in place of trust in God's power. This, in a, in a very simplified form, is a central aspect of the difference between evangelical Christians and Catholics. By evangelical here, I just mean those who emphasize the gospel. This, the, the, the Lutherans, the first uh, church of the Reformation, just called themselves evangelicals to emphasize that they were returning to the gospel. Evangelicals and, and Catholics, and you can put this in various ways, have a very different concept of rituals and what they do. Uh, in the Catholic Church to this day, there is an emphasis on the actual power of the ritual. The, the mass, various rituals, they do things to people. Uh, and this is a correct view of ceremonies under the law. Obedience to the ceremonial law was doing something. But this is described as a form of slavery. This is described as bad. This, this making salvation dependent upon works of the ceremonial law or works of the moral law is death because we can't obey it and because Ceremonies do not in themselves have this power. From the beginning, Jesus Christ has been ordained as our way to salvation. So, in some sense, the material we're treating today is the, really the moving point or the fulcrum point upon which Junius thought rests. Because when the, uh, when the, the church was having this great discovery again of the power of the gospel during the 16th and 17th century in the period we call the Reformation. What it was talking about in one sense was, is there an analogy between the, the ritualism of the Old Testament and the way that we worship in Jesus Christ? And reading particularly the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' teachings, the letters of Paul advising Gentile Christians how to understand rituals, reading the great theologian uh, Augustine, uh, reading many theologians in the Middle Ages too, the Reformation said, no, there, there is no analogy. Actually, give me, give me the second slide right, right now. Second slide, one more. I know that's one in one count, okay. In other words, Junius in this chapter, in a very simplified form, wants to say this. You know how we just talked about the judicial law? And when we talked about the judicial law, we said the judicial law, the civil law, the political law of, of Israel, is an outworking of the natural law. The natural law is just our nature. What does our nature demand of us when we think of it as given to us by God? When we consider our own natures with the knowledge that we were made by God uh, to do good works? How do, we, how do we understand our duty? And he says, in that sense, there is an immutable part of all proper judicial laws, but especially we know that the Mosaic judicial law is a good law, and we know it as an immutable part, it takes the common nature, the, the, the common conclusions of nature, and it applies them to circumstances. Now, one of those things changes, and it's not human nature. Human nature remains the same. The, the duty that God has declared to us as a law through our nature, although we're blind to it, although sin hides it from us, fortunately it's revealed in the Mosaic Law, but uh, it is unchanging. There, there will never, ever, ever be a time when it is good for people to do things, for example, whose object is shown to be against natural law in the scriptures, like murder people. It will never, ever, ever be a good thing to commit adultery. It will never, ever be a good thing to covet. Okay, Those objects are permanent. 
Now, what's changing about the Mosaic judicial law, when we talk about the Mosaic judicial law, we're not talking about this natural law now. We're talking about how it was applied to the persons, the matters, and the circumstances of, of Israel. Those things do change because the persons, the matters, and the circumstances change. Um, nevertheless, a common ratio is preserved throughout all good human laws. This is just repeating what we talked about last week. Immutable part, mutable part, to keep the ratio the, chain, the same, which is what you should do, because God applied the natural law perfectly to the persons, matters, and circumstances of Israel. If in your day you're dealing with different persons, matters, and circumstances, then the law has to change. Okay, we talked about that last week. But he says, and this is very important, when we come to the ceremonial law, both aspects are changing. Both aspects are changing. Because man fell away from God and God lifted him up in stages to himself. And this is the story of the scriptures. The progressive stages by which God took man, blinded from him, alienated from him, and drew him back. Drew all of mankind back and made the, the reality of Jesus Christ plain. Was Jesus Christ always there? Yes, Jesus Christ, in one sense, is the immutable aspect, not just of uh, the ceremonial law, but of all order, all being, all existence, everything, yes. But there's something that's changing in two ways with respect to ceremonial law. One is, God is constantly introducing new graces. He is constantly drawing us closer and closer and closer to him. You can think of this in three great stages. Three great stages. There is the, the stage uh, from the, the fall to, uh, you can either begin it with Israel and Abraham, or you can begin it with Israel at Mount Sinai. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can make this a little more complicated, but... Three great stages. The introduction of the ceremonial law. You can begin that with circumcision. Um, you can begin it with Mount Sinai. You can begin it with Passover. You can begin it in different places. But man was in a particular type of very low-grade relationship to man, uh, to God, before the coming of Revelation. And then there was a stage from the time, let's say, of Abraham or Moses to Jesus Christ. And what happens in, in Jesus Christ is the absolute pivot of history because what had previously always been in shadow was now revealed in reality. What, what previously was always looked forward to in promise had now became a reality. This is Paul's central teaching. Don't pay too much attention to these shadows. They're gone. The sun has arised. The sun has arisen, and as shadows pass away when the sun is at noon, so too the shadows of the rituals, which once were indeed our only way of seeing Christ, are now gone because the sun is here, S-O-N or S-U-N, depending on, your, on your, your preference. When the reality has come, the things which served only to point to that reality are gone. And this is the, the, the basic aspect of the gospel. It's time. Now's the time. The reality is here. You can live differently. You can live with confidence in eternal life in Jesus Christ, confidence in the power to grow in righteousness and sanctification because your sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Your debt is paid and your life eternal is assured, especially the current life that you can have with the Holy Spirit. And, and yet, there is more to come. There is still a greater grace to come in the third age, which is the period of eternal life with God, the new Jerusalem, when God himself will be our illumination. We won't need lamps, we won't need suns or moons, because God will be among us in the fullest possible way. We will see him in a way that no one has ever seen him before. 
uh, everything will fade away except rejoicing in God with the, the fullness of our strength and existence, knowing the truth, uh, blessedness. There is a, a, a movement of grace. And so Junius wants to emphasize, look, um, there is a big, big, big difference between the way the natural law, the judicial law, and the ceremonial law uh, relate to us. The moral law is constant. It's just what we are. It's just rightful reflection on what it means to be a person in relation to God. That's it. That's all. We can get better at it. We can get worse at it. Uh, the Mosaic Law teaches it perfectly. Teaches it perfectly adequately for you. You don't need to know anything better than that. That's good enough. Okay? It is alive. It is constant. It binds. It, it is real. Okay? The judicial law is dead in one sense and alive in another sense. It is dead in the sense that it was addressed to per particular persons, matters, and circumstances. But Junius says, every bit of the judicial law of Moses teaches us something which we've got to pay attention to. Every bit of the Mosaic law, the judicial law, teaches us something critical to understand how to apply the natural law to our political circumstances, right? This is what we were talking about last week. The analogy of the judicial law continues to be our, our best guide, something that we should consult to understand how we should live together in society, but only according to its analogy. That is to say, with an adjustment for changes in persons, matters, and circumstances. The ceremonial law, by contrast, is changed in two ways. The, the immutable part in the natural law of the judicial law has no analogy in the ceremonial law because the grace that God gave the people through the temple, the tabernacle, through the sacrifices, through the holy days were about anticipating Jesus Christ. The, the grace of it was here is a way of anticipating Jesus Christ and participating under forms, under shadows, under types, under symbols. And now Jesus Christ has come. And we are called to participate in him directly through faith, to live lives directly dependent upon him. So the principle of the Mosaic ceremonial law is gone. And now there is an entirely different way through Jesus Christ, a much greater way, a greater covenant, as Jeremiah has it, a new covenant, a covenant which in its superiority has made the old covenant obsolete, as we read in, in Hebrews. Okay? That's changed. And also the kinds of changes that happen to the, to the judicial law also are different. The ceremonial law of, of Israel was the law of a nation. You had to go to Jerusalem. You had to do certain things that were only available then. There were certain times when you had to do it. Those times, those circumstances have changed. The time of Sabbath observation that we find in the moral law, it was taught in the ceremonial law of Moses how to observe the, the Sabbath. But Jesus has changed the very date of the Sabbath. The Sabbath date was assigned to the, the seventh day of rest in creation. It was assigned to the, the, the commemoration of the Exodus. But now we commemorate our new creation and our new Exodus in Jesus Christ on the day of his resurrection. Hence, we worship on the Lord's day, the day of his resurrection. Why? Because the principle of grace has changed. Jesus is here. And also the circumstances have changed. Our creation is not on the seventh day, but on the eighth day, the first day of the new creation of the world in which we abide to this, to this day. So, really important, Junius thinks, really, really, really important uh, for you to understand as a, as a Christian uh, what the nature of ceremonial law is 
and how its continuation is dependent upon two principles. The first, if a ceremonial law is going to continue, it has to be a ceremonial law that continues in the same stage of grace. There's a big difference between before Christ and after Christ. And this is a major theme of the, the New Testament. This is the, the, the way that we differently relate to God, directly relate to God. The way that the, the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ provide us with direct routes of access to God rather than salvation through rituals or through works. This is basic, basic, basic gospel stuff, and it has ramifications for the law. And so he says, if we want to interpret the Mosaic law, we have got to understand the ceremonial law because its principle of continuation is very different than the natural law or moral law and the judicial law, both of which continue, one absolutely, one in a certain sense, one not only doesn't continue, but he says it's deadly. And here he's quoting Paul. He doesn't say it. I mean, it's, the, it's in the Bible. Um, it's deadly to obey the Mosaic law for your salvation now. It is deadly to look to circumcision or to animal sacrifice now that the true circumcision and the true Lamb of God have arisen. Amen? I had to say amen because I'm all excited. So this is critical, and it's critical uh, not only to us as lawyers. Well, it's critical to us as lawyers, Junius would say, if you want to pay attention to the judicial law and take its analogies seriously, as you should, according to Junius and me, for what it's worth, Junius is a much greater witness than me. If you want to take the judicial law seriously, then you need to be able to distinguish the judicial law from the ceremonial law. Because if you confuse the two, if you mix up the judicial law and the ceremonial law, you will be applying something as if its analogy should continue when it absolutely should not continue. Because the analogy that continues is trying to maintain a constant ratio between an immutable part and circumstances, matters, and persons that are changing. That's how we do it. We take the immutable part and we apply it according to the same principle that God applied it in the, the Old Testament in the Mosaic human law. That's how we do it. But with respect to the ceremonial law, there's a different principle. The numerator is changing too. And so you can draw no consistent analogy. And if you try to do that, then it's deadly. And this is exactly the, the error that the Reformation said had crept into the Roman Catholic Church. Not to all Roman Catholics, by any means, but into the Roman Catholic Church, which had explicitly, if you read the Council of, of Trent, it explicitly says we may draw analogies about how we should worship today from the way that people worshiped in the Old Testament ceremonial law. And Junius says, this is deadly. We get the temptation. Ritual is important. We get it. Money's important. Sex is important. Power is important. We get it. These things are important. But that makes it all the riskier because we are drawn in temptation to these things. And the, the claim of the Reformation was, the call of the Reformation was, to return to the true understanding of the gospel, which is very simple and very plain, which is our salvation is by faith alone in Jesus Christ, not by rituals. And the Mosaic law is equally plain. Your salvation is by obedience to the law of the rituals. And these two things could not be presented as more in war or in contrast in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those things were good when they were approached in faith and understanding them as symbols. They had powerful effects. They also, as Moses observes, have powerful natural effects. One of the reasons Moses says the ceremonial law is given is to make the nation stronger, to keep it separate from the other nations. 
It has natural effects, rituals. We all know this, rituals are great. If you want to strengthen a, a group, rituals are very important. There's nothing wrong with rituals. There is absolutely something wrong with the church proclaiming a ritual as necessary in a legal sense as it was under the Mosaic law. Okay? Judicial law, ceremonial law. One is partially immutable, partially mutable. One is mutable and mutable. Examples, examples. Junius likes this example because it happens, the mutability of the ceremonial law happens all within the history of Israel. He says, look, even within the history of Israel, you see how mutable the law is of ceremonies. Because we get one ritual for the day of Passover itself. On the day of Passover itself, you are told how to eat the Passover lamb. With your sandals on, with your staff in your hand, you're to eat it because you're heading out that day. Okay? You are to spread the blood over your door because it's through your faith in the blood of the lamb that you are going to be saved that night from being killed by the angel of death. Right? That's how you eat the Passover lamb that night. It is a ceremony. And anyone who didn't obey that, anyone who didn't do those things, died. Right? But Moses immediately goes on and says, and hereafter, and after this, you're going to celebrate the Passover in a totally different way, as a remembrance of a past grace. You are going to renew yourself through this ceremony as part of the Passover people, as part of of the Exodus people by remembering what was done in the past through a quite different ritual. Two rituals are presented in the scriptures, one after another, one for a particular time, the night of Passover, where you'll immediately die if you don't fulfill it, and another one for the life of the nation, where God says if you don't follow it, you'll be cursed. Okay? We all together? The, the Passover, he says, is a really good example. What's the difference between the two laws? Well, there are two kinds of differences. There are differences in the grace that God is providing, a means to avoid death that night. And there are also differences in the circumstances. The circumstances were they were actually going to walk through the desert that night, so they needed to have their sandals on and their staff in hand. But when you're just commemorating this when you live in the land, different circumstances. You don't need to have, there's no law that says when you eat the Passover meal, you have to have your sandals on. I don't know. What did people do? I don't know. My, my sense from the scriptures is people ate barefoot a lot. I don't know. Is that gross to eat barefoot? I don't eat barefoot. Do you eat barefoot? I don't eat barefoot. Anyway, it doesn't matter, okay? The point is, it was commanded on the day of the Passover, and it was not commanded thereafter. Why? because the circumstances were different. The first Passover, they were about to take a several day march into the desert, okay? Also, the principle of grace is different. One is looking forward to the promise that God would save them from death that night, from the angel of death that was coming to take the firstborn. The other is looking back in time, remembering that, remembering that grace, participating in it by remembrance and believing that God would save us again in a greater way. Okay? You see the difference? Both principles are changing. Another example he gives is he says, God provided very early on in, in Exodus that how to make an altar. When they were walking around in the desert, God said, make an altar out of dirt. Make an altar out of dirt. Why? Because they were in the desert. They, they were out in the desert. That's all they had was dirt. If you in a desert, the only thing you're rich in is dirt. Okay? And they had a lot of it, and that's what they were to make the altar of. Thereafter, God said, make it out of wood. Thereafter, God said, cover it in bronze. 
But still thereafter, after the time of the tabernacle, when Jerusalem was conquered, remember initially Jerusalem wasn't conquered. David conquers Jerusalem, the city of David. Um, and then comes the temple. God wanted them in Jerusalem. He wanted to consecrate Jerusalem. He provided for them to go into consecration. And when they had Jerusalem, when they owned Jerusalem, when the kingdom was established, then the temple was built. And not out of, out of dirt, not out of wood, not out of bronze, but out of gold, they built the altar in the temple. Why? The principle of grace was changing. They lived in one way in the desert. They lived in another way in the land when they had the, the tabernacle with them. And they lived in a final way when they had the city and the wealth and the gold of Solomon, when all the nations of the world were bringing their gold to, to Solomon. And Junius is making a rather elaborate analogy here, too. He doesn't spell this out, but he's making an elaborate analogy about the three great periods of man. Man, man in, the, in the, the earliest stage before Moses, the period between Moses and Christ, and the, the kingdom of gold to, to come. Okay? So he says, look at the Mosaic ceremonial law itself. It teaches us this principle. The Mosaic law of ceremonies itself teaches us this principle by making them mutable. Why is it mutable? It's mutable because God was showing different stages of grace even within the life of, of Israel and because they were facing different circumstances. You can't make an altar out of gold if you're surrounded by sand in the desert. So God didn't want them to do that. But when you have all the wealth of the nations flowing into you, now you can make an altar out of gold. Go ahead, guys, make it out of gold. Okay? Is that, is that clear? This is the line that, that Junius is, is pursuing. Okay, let's go back one slide now. So you remember this, this discussion we had before about, about the dialectical uh, development of the categories of, of law. Uh, law is either eternal or not eternal, right? I mean, it's just, it's got to be one or the other. Um, if you walk up to any law, you can say, are you eternal? And if, if the, law, the law says yes, well, then you, you know it's one kind of law. And if it says no, it belongs to an entirely different type of, of law. And we have a name for the eternal law. That's God. There's only one eternal, unchanging thing that guides everything, to which everything must seek a correspondence, that's God, okay? The temporal law that we we're, we're talking about is of a different order. It comes about, it's ordered and knowable in a different kind of, of way. We live in time. These are laws that we can know directly. And he says, of temporal laws, Temporal laws can only be of two kinds. Either the law will arise according to the nature of a thing, God bless you, or it will arise, as he calls it, adventitiously, which just means it comes to nature. It's something that advenes. It happens to things that exist. And he says, okay, let's, here's a good one. Let's call the, the laws that come about by nature, let's call those temporal laws natural laws. Right? If there's a duty that you have because of what you are, let's call it natural law. And now let's think about the laws that don't arise because of things nature, but come to them. How are we going to distinguish them? And if you remember what he said was, let's distinguish them. We're going to call them divine and human law, but let's distinguish them. The, he says, look, divine law isn't a perfect term because in some sense, all laws are divine because they all come from God. But you, you, you'll see why he calls it that in a second. Let's distinguish it and let's talk about laws that advene to nature that are within the power of man. They are things that man can do by his natural operation. They are things that man can assign and do by his natural operation. He doesn't mean by this you don't need scripture. What he means by this is, in principle, man could do them. If man had a good nature, 
he could do these things. Man doesn't know the natural law because of sin, but in principle, he would know the natural law. Okay? Man, in principle, could make human laws. Man does make human laws. It's something he can do. It's human law. Right? It, adv it advenes from man's natural powers. But he says... There's another type of law that it means. And this is a law which does things for man that are beyond his powers. You could call it supernatural. He calls it divine. Both are good. Um, the supernatural or divine law is set out because it pertains to things man can't do. God has to do them. The, the divine law is all about something man can't do. What is it? Man, because he's made in the, the image of, of God, uh, has a, a desire. He has a natural desire to honor and to worship God. This is why the Ten Commandments teach natural law, even though they teach about basic duties of worshiping God and seeking God. But he says, man has this problem. Even in a perfect state, he lacks the power to do what is beyond his nature. And it is beyond man's nature to be one with God. It is beyond man's nature to climb up to heaven and be with God. Man cannot do this. Man is what man is. Man has a, a place in creation above the animals and below the angels. He has an assignment in creation, and it is, it is in the middle, above animals and below angels. We have a, a limited power, a limited place. But we have a knowledge, a natural knowledge, he says, in our nature, because we are imprinted with God's image, to worship God. But we don't know how to do it truly. We don't know how to, how to do it fully. I, I long uh, I long for many things. I want, I want apples and oranges and steaks and rice and bread and many good things, right? I, I, want, um, I want marriage. I want friendship. I want children. I want uh, a good political order. I want many, many things. I want to pass my contracts midterm. Many things. Some of them are beyond our grasp. Some of them are, are ready are ready at hand. I desire them. But in all of those things, they, even contracts, they are within the natural grasp of man. But to, to be related to God as a, a wife to a husband, as a friend to a friend, uh, to, to see him and adore him is not within our powers because my eyes are too weak and my ears are too weak and my, my grasp is too short. Amen? And so, there's another law that advenes, and it is the divine law. And the divine law, uh, Junius says, the divine law is a divine action. It is a divine action in which we participate through following God. And the only way this can happen, because it is beyond our nature, is if God tells us what to do. This is really important to think about. The, the, the divine law, as he develops it in this dialectic, is all about things we can't do. It, it is represented to us in the Mosaic law in a particular way. When the closest way you could get to Christ, because he hadn't come yet, was under various forms and images. And if you want to read about this, the book of Hebrews is an entire discussion of the way that every little bit of the Mosaic ceremonial law was about Jesus Christ and how you could worship Jesus Christ under a sign, under a shape, under a figure, under an analogy in the Mosaic law. The divine law is about what we can't do. It is a divine action to which we respond. 
God says, you don't know what's coming. You don't understand about Jesus Christ. It's not the time yet to reveal it to you. If, if I told you all about the gospel now, you wouldn't get it. You have to be shaped by the God, for the gospel, by the, the teaching of the moral law I've given you. I have to prepare you in many different kinds of ways, help you understand your sin, help you understand your need, help you understand that there's more to human life than this life, that there is emphatically a greater way of being connected to God through the Spirit, which will go on forever in a way beyond anything you can imagine. You're not ready for that yet, but you can still participate it in a way. Do these things. Build this tabernacle. Build this temple. Sacrifice this lamb. Sacrifice these pigeons. Offer these sacrifices of grain. Burn these things of incense. Go to Jerusalem. Do these things. Do not do these things. Do these things. And in that way, you could participate in a form in the gospel. The law then was about what God was doing. God was doing, he was providing a particular type of grace for a particular type of time for a particular type of people. God is still doing that. But God has increased the grace. He himself has come to us. He has transformed two things. He has transformed the nature of his grace. He has himself appeared to us, not under forms and figures, not mysteriously, but in the knowable person of Jesus Christ, whose words we can read in the Scripture, whose touch we can have through the Holy Spirit, whose voice we can hear through the Holy Spirit, whose guidance we can have in our hearts now through the sincere worship of God, not through obedience to laws, not through shapes, but through direct, unmediated faith in Him alone. The grace has changed. We still have rituals. We have the Lord's Supper. We have baptism, for example, right? They operate entirely differently. They are not the power of salvation. They are recognitions. They are uh, ways in which we understand and typify what is happening right now, not what will happen, not through shadow, but in reality. Both principles have changed. It's still ceremonial law because it's still about what God is doing. It's not about what we're doing. That's human law. What ceremonial law is is what God does and how we respond to it, to participate in God's actions of grace. So with this chart, you can, you can reinterpret it now and understand the centrality of, of what's going on here. The separation of the Mosaic divine law or ceremonial law from the human law. What's the basic principle of separation? The basic principle of separation is one concerns what man can do. It is a right ordering of man's powers and operations. The moral law, it's what my nature tells me to do. The, the human law tells me how to apply that to circumstances, particularly politically. How do we apply that to the circumstances of seeking the common good of a state or nation, okay? What does the ceremonial law do? The ceremonial law must be distinguished. We are very liable to get confused if we do not clearly separate these two things because you should look at the Mosaic human law and think, how can I apply this today? What lessons does it have for me today? But you should not look, you should not look at the ceremonial law with the same sense. Because the ceremonial law is deadly in a way that the judicial law is not deadly. You can make the exact same judgment for your people that the people of Israel did. You can say, oh, we should, theft is morally wrong, we should punish theft. You can make that judgment. You can follow Moses in that. There's nothing wrong with that. You can, you can make that judgment. You can say, I'm going to follow the, the natural law by punishing theft in our state. By contrast, if you say, I want to build up our state by imposing a ritual of circumcision and telling people that if they're not circumcised, that they cannot know and be one with the people and God, then you are doing something deadly. 
because you are turning people away from the new order of grace in Jesus Christ, which is higher, and the scriptures told us has made that old ceremonial law obsolete. When you, when you get married and you're, you know, the wedding's over and you, you go to the, the hotel, if you pull out your phone and look at pictures of your, of your spouse, they'll get mad at you. If, you, if it's after the wedding and you're just looking at your phone going, oh, my, my wife is so beautiful or my husband is so handsome, and they're over there going, I'm here, hello. We make the same noxious error if in the presence of the realities of Jesus Christ, we turn away from him and turn to an analogy with the old ceremonial law. Now, last point. One of the things that, that Junius does in this that, that I think is very, very, very powerful is he, uh, and this is the final chapter that we'll, we'll deal with, he points out that many, 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 many times in the Old Testament, the ceremonial and the judicial law are mixed. They are mixed together. They are mixed. And so if you have concerns about how you should follow the judicial law, you have to be very careful to separate the two. So this chapter of, of Theses, he is talking about the different mutability of the divine law compared to the judicial law. In the next, and this is the conclusion of the book. This is where he thinks this is so super important that for the purposes of the world they were in, where they were dealing with Roman Catholic ritualism, this was really important to maintain. And also dealing with people who were getting confused about which parts of the judicial law should apply, the very conclusion that we'll turn to the week after next, next week we have a guest speaker, uh, is how do we separate the laws that have a mixture of ceremony and, and judicial aspects? But he gives us an example today. He says, look, you have to be very careful because as we talked about before, we evaluate the, the form of a law according to three aspects, origin, object, and motive. Origin, object, and motive. Remember that? A couple weeks ago, you may, may, may have forgotten. Junius reminds us that something can be a ceremonial law according to those three things. Same way. If they are a ceremonial law according to any one of them, then you have to account for their mutability in terms of that. So something can be a ceremonial law in origin if it is a way of the people looking back to their foundation in God. And he gives the example of the inalienability of property in Israel. He says, lots of societies have had inalienable property. That's a feature of many societies. In Israel, it had a specific origin. Inalienability of property, meaning you can't sell and transfer property once you get it, has a, a purpose in creating social stability, in avoiding certain problems that can arise because of the free sale of land. It creates landless groups of people who are very poor and dependent upon others. Many societies have had no sale of land, particularly in the ancient world where land was the chief form of capital. In Israel, that feature of the civil law, the judicial law, had a ceremonial origin because God said, do this not for its various benefits, although that's one of the reasons you do them. There is a judicial reason given. There's also a ceremonial reason given. And the ceremonial reason is so that you will know that you are mine, you are my tenants, you are on the land through my grace, so that you always have a, a lively memory that this land is not yours, but I gave it to each one of you. It's not yours to give away because I gave it to you. You will keep fresh in your mind. It is the, the principle of inalienability was a ceremony of regarding their economic origins in God. 
Was it an object ceremony? No, it was not a ceremony in object. It was not a ceremony in object, but it had a ceremonial origin. What's our, what are ceremonial objects? Ceremonial objects are, are things like worship me in this way, sacrifice animals on this, on this altar, do these things so that you can uh, worship me, praise me, so that you can be close to me, so that you can be atoned with me, be at one with me, do these things in this way. Okay? That's not, that's not what the land, no land sale rule was doing. It had its in its origin. And it can also be, he says, in its motive or in its end. And he gives the, the interesting example of the sanctification of the firstborn in Israel, which he said had the, the purpose, the ceremonial purpose, of providing someone to lead worship in every family. One, the firstborn would lead worship, had responsibilities for worshiping and praising God. And also, he says, if you'll remember that law, what it says is, sanctify me the firstborn of every womb, every, every human and every animal. But you sanctify them in very different ways, very different ways. The firstborn animal is sacrificed. The firstborn son is redeemed. He is redeemed from death. And he says in that way, there was a typical image of Christ in every family. The motive was to provide every family with a shadow, a symbol of Jesus Christ, who is called the firstborn, the firstborn of creation, the firstborn of the resurrection, the firstborn of the church. Every family was to have in its presence a person who had been redeemed from death by God's grace, raised up to be a leader of the family. Okay? It's, it's not in object. We're not talking about the ritual of redemption of the firstborn. We're not talking about the sacrifice of the animal. We're, we're talking about the motive of that. Its purpose is so that something else will happen. Every family will have a ceremonial leader. Every family will have a type in it of God's work of redemption so that they could see Christ in a particular way. Understanding this point is critical to understanding one of the challenges of separating the judicial law from the ceremonial law. Junius says it's really easy to get confused. It's really easy to only look at the judicial part of the law and forget its ceremonial function because it can appear in three places, in origin, in object, the objects we see. Most people have a pretty clear sense of what a ceremonial law is. Because it's supernatural, because it's not something we can do in our own strength, it tends to look pretty arbitrary to us. It's not something you would usually do. We recognize ceremonies because they're not things you usually do. Military ceremony, right? Do you walk around just doing this naturally? No, you don't do that naturally, right? We, we have a military salute that is an unnatural act. Why? Because it looks ceremonial, right? We, I'm talking here about civil ceremonies. If you're walking around, do you normally just, do you do that motion very much? No. Why do we, why do we greet one another with a little bow? Because it's an action which is set apart from actions which happen naturally as you're going along, so it stands out. Ceremonies are really easy to recognize that way because they consist of things that don't have a natural explanation. Why? Because they belong to the supernatural ordering of God. All right? Okay. So, very quick conclusion. The distinction between the ceremonial and the human law is critical. It's critical if you want to follow the analogy of the judicial law. You must distinguish the human ceremonial law that was given to the, to the Israelites from the judicial law that was given to the Israelites. It is very important to understand this also as a Christian because it is a temptation of Christians. It is a temptation of Christians to make ritual with all of its power and all of its greatness. It is a, a temptation to allow that natural good to eclipse a much greater good that we have in Jesus Christ. 
and the New Testament teaches us we should be very wary of doing that. You should be very careful in the way that you approach rituals. And God gave us in the New Testament very special, specific rituals, which in their simplicity and their flexibility point us not to themselves, but to God. Okay? For theological purposes, as you're trying to understand your life as a Christian, understanding the ceremonial law of Moses and its deadliness, its abrogation when the reality of new grace in Jesus Christ came is very important. Next week, we'll see it's equally important to understand the full ways in origin, object, and motive that we have to disentangle in many laws the ceremonial from the, from the judicial. Uh, because if we want to apply the analogy of, of law, we need to make sure that we're applying the judicial law and not some aspect of the mutable ceremonial law. Um, that was very fast, but it's very important. You can meditate on this. Please do. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice in the, the knowledge and the wisdom that you have revealed to us in your word and in good servants like Junius uh, that try to spell it out for us and make it clearer for us. Our Father in heaven, uh, whatever else we, we have done today, let us always consider how we have a complete and unmediated access to you through Jesus Christ, how through faith in him and, and his blood and his resurrection, we have the realization of all that was foreshadowed in the ceremonies of Moses. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.